My name is Tim Udren and I'm the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Renewable Power in the Office of Energy Efficiency and Renewable, Renewable Energy. And uh, I, I used to have an old minivan and uh, it wasn't old actually, it was a fairly new minivan. It was our family car but as we'd drive it down the road it would just sometimes decide it was time to shut off the engine. And uh, that was all great except the power steering would go away, the power brakes would go away. And I had a teenage daughter that was still kind of learning to drive as uh, that seemed like the vehicle she was going to be driving. And that just didn't really work out so well. And uh, I, I tended to call that car unreliable. I didn't think it was really suited for the purpose that uh, we had for my daughter to drive it. And I thought, uh, if I had that car today, would anybody want to buy it? Yeah, yeah probably not. Probably not. Nobody would want to buy it. So, my, tit my title is Challenges and Opportunities for Renewable Energy. My idea today is to make you think. Uh, I'm going to kind of give you some concepts and ideas and things that float around in my head, and so it could be kind of scary. Uh, renewables are interesting. So I talk about my unreliable minivan. Renewable power is something that is variable, intermittent, and sometimes we might think it could just go away kind of like my minivan. So we called my minivan unreliable. Would we call renewable power unreliable? It's okay, you can say yeah, because it kind of matches the same scenario, right? But the reality is, is that renewable power is a new type of energy that we really have just started to integrate on our grid. Solar power today is only 1% of our use. Wind is not much more than that. And so we have these new types of energy sources on our grid that are not quite like we used to have the energy sources on our grid. And I call that maybe classic energy, the way energy used to be. We had lots of control over it. We knew exactly what was going to happen to this newer type of energy where we have less control and we don't quite know. So we're comparing a new type of thing and putting it into a, try to, an old classic box. When, uh, before I worked in renewable power, I did a lot of work in efficiency. And in efficiency, when it started out back in the 70s, Efficiency was turn things off and make you cold or make you hot. And so it was basically create an unpleasant environment for us. And that was how we implemented efficiency back in the 70s. I got myself an old book at home in my library. I like to look at it so often just to remind myself of the progress we've made. Back from the Carter administration, it was a federal book that says how you go about reducing energy use in federal buildings. And it basically tells you how you shut down things and how you can take and take out light bulbs out of fixtures to make it darker because you don't need that much light anyway. But today, efficiency has evolved. And instead of efficiency making the place less comfortable and less desirable to work in, we actually have figured out how to take those new technologies and make it more comfortable and more desirable to work in. And by doing that, we've actually transformed the thinking about efficiency so now we think of efficiency as something positive in a building. It actually helps the building because we improve the way it operates. Perhaps a solution like that is right in front of us for renewable power. So if you think about, uh-oh, here we go. We already have a failure. If we think about our budget and we think about how we spend our money, we, we, we earn some money over, we earn some money over on the one side and we spend some money on the side, and this is a month timeline here. So over a month, we have to make sure that how much comes in over the month is enough to cover how much we spend over the month. Is that how your budget works? Mine actually, this is bigger sometimes. I don't know why that is, but it just always seems to work out that way. Sometimes we seem to spend more than we have coming in, and then next month we have to spend less to make up for it. But this is a budgetary scenario. So this is great for how we do our budget, but this isn't really quite how our electrical power system works. Our electrical power system works more like on a cash flow basis. And by a cash flow basis, it means that we have to have the money coming in when we need the money. So since we all work at Department of Energy, I all know when you get paid. You got paid today. And imagine in two weeks, when you're supposed to get paid on the 28th, you have a big bill coming due on the 27th and it's more than you have in your bank account and your paycheck hasn't come in yet, you have a cash flow problem. You have the budgetary means to make it, but you don't have the cash flow to make it. The electrical power system works like a cash flow system. The day that we make an electron over here on the left side of our chart, that moment it's made, it has to have a place to go. 
And the moment we need an electron on the right side of the chart, it's got to be made. That moment has to happen. And so when we think about that system, how do we try to buffer that and try to fix something like that so that it doesn't operate in such an instantaneous, just-in-time necessary system? Kind of like we saw with those charts with all the trucks and the fuel that we just saw. That's quite an incredible process. It's a little bit of a just-in-time system, but we've got kind of a little bit of a cache in the volume of the trucks and the volume of the tanks of the delivery. Here, we don't have any of that. So, obviously, storage could provide us a way to buffer that, right? So, when we think about our renewable power and what's happening in our renewable power system, we have some dramatic cost reductions that have occurred recently. And perhaps uh, yesterday, our solar program, maybe you heard our solar program announced it met its goals. The sunshot goal of getting to three, getting to six cent power, three cents is the new goal. Six cent power by 2020 was met in 2017. And we made that announcement yesterday at the Solar Power International Conference in Las Vegas. And uh, that was a great achievement for us. And so that means we have more and more of this renewable power coming onto the system. But we also know that as we add more of this renewable power of this stuff that at least we think about it like classic energy, it's not the same and not quite considered as reliable as the, as the energy that we are used to, we have to figure out how to solve some of these issues. And again, energy storage comes back into the, into the play. But when we think about storage, the first thing people think about is putting a battery on the system. Putting batteries here, there, and everywhere. Now, batteries have a great function on the system, and they will offer us some advances and ways to control our system like we have not been able to do in the past. But batteries aren't necessarily the end-all, end-all of how we should work and think about our system. Perhaps batteries are just taking this new power of renewable energy, which has this weird nature that we call unreliable, but it's variable, it's here, it's up, it's down, it ba varies based on the resource. And maybe what we're doing is, is we're trying to make, take batteries, apply it to this new power, and make it look more like our classical thinking about power, making it look like the old way we made power. So the idea behind this is that maybe we can think of storage differently than just as a battery. Maybe we can think of storage in the way that we have the ability to control our loads. Over the past few years, our building technologies program here in DOE, in the Energy EERE office, has done some great advancements in technology. Industry has taken a lot of advancements as well, and we have a vast array of control capabilities that we have at our buildings. Now, I've shown it as a house, but the reality is this could be a building of any type and shape or size. We have a significant amount of controllability out in those systems. For years, we've used that control to effectively try to shape the load of our use out here in the end, which is often a peak in the middle of the day or late in the day and cascades off. And we try to push that demand down by using these electronics to turn things on and off and control them. And we've had some, some success at that, but we haven't necessarily had all the success, but the reality is we have a significant amount of control out in these devices they haven't really tapped before. Perhaps we can use the control we have on these devices to do some obvious things that are like storage, like water heating. Maybe we can heat the water off-peak when we don't really need it, store it for later on. But maybe not so obvious is maybe we can change the way we heat and cool the building such that we might allow ourselves a little bit of range of temperatures that the building can operate in but yet still maintain comfort and shift its load a little later in the day or a little earlier in the day. For solar, which peaks somewhat, just let's say afternoon, to a building peak which might come a little bit later in the day, if we could shift our load earlier in the day and use that solar peak, it might benefit us to keep the grid a little bit more stable and help eliminate some of the strangeness that the new types of power cause. So as we begin to look at how we can integrate that, now we add a source on one side and we can add another source as well. When we add these sources in, we begin to look at what wind or solar does. We recognize that we have some ability to control those as well that we didn't have before because of the interfaces that those provide into the system. Solar in particular is a very exciting opportunity in that on the load side, we have electronic interfaces to all these devices now. 
But we also have an electronic interface over to the source side. Both of these are going through like a power inverter or power converter type system. So what we can do now is possibly see how we can integrate the control of these two devices to provide a storage type of mechanism. So we might be able to interface with the solar that might appear not on the source side, but also appear on the load side with some of the loads to help alleviate what the power system has to provide. In addition, we could also look at how the wind might coordinate with the solar or even other sources out on the system in order to create a storage type of function that from the grid standpoint, power flows are adjusted and we take away some of the need for the just-in-time need of the system going back and forth because we don't have a need on this side or we may have excess capacity over here that we have reserved for later. So the idea behind the concept of new ways to look at our energy use and our energy source is really to try to take the story that I started out with, how energy efficiency has transformed from being something that we kind of consider clunky and hard to use and a challenge into what we have today of something that actually improves our life and works better. I believe we have the, also that same possibility in the future with renewable power as we begin to expand the use of how the loads and the sources can better interact, better understand each other, and use our advanced communication techniques from the electronic interfaces we have on both sides of the system now to better coordinate and provide a storage type solution in the future that really doesn't necessarily depend upon batteries, but uses batteries as well as that to create a more stable grid. Thanks.